Mr. Crispin here once again and welcome to my workshop. I've just returned from having taken part in a 96 gun salute to mark the Queen's funeral. So thank you to my retired colleague and friend Richard Ingley for inviting me to join the shooting party in which I formed part of the Black Powder Division. Now while on the topic of birth, deaths and marriages, I have another little announcement to make and that is that the month of September 2022 marks my 10 year service anniversary at Rolls Royce. So I have now by default officially moved from the category of beginner into intermediate and hopefully there's many more years there to come. On to today's engineering topics and this video is the start of a multi-part series in which I'm going to be dealing with lathe headstock tooling. Over the course of this series I'm going to sort out the lathe spindle nose, I'm going to sort out the back plates for the various attachments, I'm going to sort out the jaws for some of the attachments and I'm going to create an ER40 collet chuck for this lathe so that I can use the MyFood ER40 collet on both machines. Today is all about setting up a tool post grinder and I have called today's video setting a tool post grinder the Mr Crispin way for one reason only and that is because I've done no research into how you are supposed to set a tool post grinder up. I have just approached this from the point of view of standard machining principles. So you're welcome to leave me comments if you are an experienced tool post grinding setter. Um, all I will say, the applications I've seen of tool post grinders on YouTube have mainly been for grinding the internal faces on three jaw chucks. Um, the geometry I'm going to be grinding over the course of this series is a little more involved and so some elements of precision are required in the setup as you will see in this video. Apart from that I will let everything play out and explain itself so let's head over to the lathe. I've decided to do today's video in reverse order. I'm going to start by showing you the finished setup. I'm going to highlight a few elements of the finished setup and then I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning and take you through the steps I went through to get here. So without further ado, here we have a Dumore number 44 tool post grinder. It has come all the way from America via a very kind subscriber and it's proved a great addition to the workshop. This will be the first time I actually use it in anger and it has taken quite a bit of tinkering to get it to run on 110 volts but I'm uh, all there now and as you'll see I think there's nothing stopping me carrying out the grinding operations that I'm planning to. The setup is as follows. This is the do more tool post grinding unit, wheel, wheel guard, spindle, body, motor and underneath that can be seen various things. It is mounted on a pillar Underneath the pillar is a metal disc. Underneath the metal disc is the lathe top slide and in here is a large T-nut that clamps the whole thing together. Also, you will notice that the top slide is set to an angle. This happens to be a very specific angle and I have set that angle uh, ahead of what I will be actually grinding with the tool post grinder. So more on that in the video where I do the grinding, but what you need to know is this needs to be a specific angle and the grinder then needs setting up correctly on top of it. So to begin I'm going to go all the way back down to the bottom and I'm going to consider how I might set this accurately to a specific angle which happens to be 7.125 degrees. Here at the lathe I am setting the top slide angle to match the taper that I'm trying to produce. Now to do this setup I'm using the Joe Pyzinski method whereby the tailstock quill is used as the zero reference and a bit of geometry is constructed using the machine's positioning. So I'll walk you through this and first of all I'm going to establish the zero point for the setting operation and that is here. So to get to the zero firstly I need the top slide all the way at its rearward position and I'm then going to wind on to zero taking the backlash out in the direction I'm about to travel. The dial is now reading zero, the backlash is taken out and we're at the rearward position. I am now going to bring the cross slide in until my dial indicator reads zero. This happens to be a 2 micron dial indicator and that's on zero. And while I'm here I'm going to look up to the digital readout and I'm going to zero the x-axis. Turning back to the top slide 
I am now going to construct this 50 millimeter length. Now this is two millimeters per turn so I'm going to do 25 turns and when doing any large number of turns on a manual machine I like to follow the following steps. First of all lock the door and unplug the phone. Second of all take a visual note of where the handle is at the zero position which is about four o'clock in this case and secondly as I wind the handle round I'm going to pause at this position for each count as in one, two, three, four. This is opposed to going this is as opposed to going one, two, three, four, five, six, and when you get to fourteen you think am I on fourteen or fifteen? Hopefully this way I stay in sync. So this is zero, that's zero, that's zero. One, two, three, four, five, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five. Back to zero. So I have now moved the needle of the indicator from here to here. And all that remains is to come in with the cross slide now and see if this number adds up. If this is truly flat, the start point's correct, and I've moved exactly 50 millimetres at 7.125 degrees, I should be left with a drop of 6.201 millimetres. So in goes the cross slide. And a quick look up to the digital readout. Oh, uh, I'm exactly right. Having set the angle, I now require a few pieces of tooling. One being the large T-nut and the other being this disc. That sorts out the base of this uh, piece and the centre by the way is just relieved to help it sit nice and flat on whatever it happens to sit on and here I'm just going to do a quick check for parallel. Uh, this is a tenth clock and for the metric viewers uh, each division on a tenth clock is just over two and a half microns. It will be uh, 2.54 microns <coughs> and uh, I'm literally just checking to see how parallel this is. This uh, teardrop shaped stylus by the way is in theory designed to reduce cosine error. But all I'm really interested in here is what kind of whoops what kind of uh, parallelism I have. Maybe three tenths, which is uh, fine. So on to the next stage of the setup. So that's the angle, the T-nut and the disc. But what about everything on top? Off comes the main tool post. And I did actually stone all this flat when I uh, rebuilt the machine. So... Um, I'm fairly happy that that is all nice and flat. I'll just see uh, out of interest how the disc 
slides along there. That's not it. that's nice and flat, so um, no need for any additional stoning. Into here goes the nut I've made. On top goes the disc. Into there goes the threaded rod. All the way down and back a little bit. And onto there, of course, goes the grinder. Okay, the first setup operation I'm going to carry out is to come around here and remove the spacers which exposes a 3 inch diameter and then I'm also going to put something of a 3 inch diameter into this chuck and obviously when the top of this and the top of that are the same then the spindle is on centre height and to check this I've got the uh, height gauge again and first I shall just visually check it's anywhere near So we're just touching there and we are a long way off there so I need to slacken this which happens to be that one and the whole unit should slide up Let's nip it up there and we'll have another look. So over here, find the high spot, bring that to zero. And then come back over here. Find the high spot and just offer it up. Or uh, offer it down in fact. No, offer it up. It tends to ride up as I tighten it, so I'm going to start slightly low. Apologies if my arm is now blocking the screen. Alright, high spot. That's a sail height, that is uh, okay, nice and tight. I could take this opportunity as well just to see what the uh, spindle run out's like. Nothing to write home about there. Okay, what I'm going to do now <coughs> is I'm going to make a collar. Uh, first of all, 
obviously as soon as I move this again I will lose the centre height and secondly um, I'm not totally convinced that this clamp arrangement is uh, entirely robust. I'm sure I'm sure it doesn't move but um, you know, when this thing is running at a high speed I would like to think that it can't move so what I'm going to do is get some slip gauges measure the gap between the base and the underneath and then turn up a quick collar that fits in here and means that it can't go any lower. Right, I have been to the Myford and I've made an aluminium collar and you can perhaps see in here the clamping mechanism it's just this uh, bolt and then a uh, portion of a radius in there that comes and grips on this diameter so uh, I've opted to make it sit on a collar just so it can't go anywhere. Um, right. So I'm about a half a thou height, that's fine, and the, the uh, beauty of doing this is that now while I'm setting up the next stage, or for that matter any subsequent stage, uh, I don't really have to worry about the thing moving up and down because it's sitting on the collar and I can um, remove worrying about the centre height from any further uh, considerations. So that has given me a grinding spindle that is at least in this orientation on centre height. Assuming this is perpendicular as it spins round it should maintain its centre height but nothing is uh, proven yet. The next topic I'm going to introduce is that of spindle alignment and somehow I have to now get this spindle pointing straight down the lathe spindle or at least square to all the axes and to introduce this topic let's have a look at a milling machine. Every professional miller and hopefully every amateur miller knows that for proper milling the spindle should be correctly aligned to the plane described by the axes of travel, which also happens to be the plane described by the bed. In a well built machine tool the bed and the axes of travel are generally considered as one and to represent that I'm going to put this sheet of metal down. This is the plane we are working to and the process of aligning the spindle means to get the spindle at a 90 degree angle in both directions of travel. Once the spindle is at 90 degrees on two planes we consider it to be perpendicular and you might hear this referred to as having a trammed head uh, and the process of aligning the spindle is often referred to as tramming a head and that's typically done with a clock sweeping round and indicating what the errors are at various locations. Now the question is why am I telling you this in context to a tool post grinder? And the answer is very much in the word why. Why does it matter if the spindle is perpendicular to this plane? Well the answer is geometry. Let's have a look at what happens if your spindle is not perpendicular to this plane. The outside of a standard milling cutter often describes a cylinder and to represent that I have something cylindrical. Now imagine first of all that the head is out of squareness in this direction. So the cutter is tipped up. Now imagine that the machine feeds along this axis. As you can see when it's flat there is no gap anywhere around the periphery. When the squareness is lost in that direction you can see that the cutter is no longer in contact with that plane in a flat manner it's now touching on the edge of the radius and as a result as it feeds along that will produce a concave radius channel. Taking the same error so the head is tipped that way imagine now feeding in the other axis so the machine is feeding along this way as you can see it's no longer flat it's producing an angle so this time it's not going to produce a radius but it is going to produce an angle and if you have lots of passes next to each other you would produce a jagged surface exactly the same thing applies when considering the other direction if the head was out this way it would produce an angle when feeding in one direction 
and a concave channel when feeding in the other direction. It's all about the relationship between the spindle, this plane and the direction you happen to be feeding. These topics are often discussed in the context of milling but they actually apply to all machining and they actually apply to the tool post grinder. If you want the end of a rotating surface to produce the correct geometry the spindle must be aligned. So the spindle needs to be perpendicular but the question is perpendicular to what? The answer is of course perpendicular to the spindle when considered both in this direction and in this direction and that happens to be the plane that you would create when you take a facing cup. So how am I going to go about this? Well looking from this view you can see what I've done. I've mounted a piece of aluminium into the chuck and I've taken a facing cup so this gives me a reference for the plane that is square to the spindle and all that remains now is to align this to this face. So to begin I'm going to just visually square up what's going on down here and then bring the tail stock in and just bring the cross slide until I'm roughly in the middle okay next up comes just to stop that going anywhere next up comes the typical clamp and into that of course goes the holdings for a clock. So now as I rotate this you can see that the clock goes round with it. I'm actually going to just increase the uh, size of the arc ever so slightly. And with that said, I'm going to begin on this horizontal plane. So I'm going to, just all visually to begin with, come in so we're pretty close. Pretty close, so it's not bad actually. Let's put on a bit of a, a loading. It's up to zero on the three o'clock position. Not bad. I'm going to have to slacken the uh, motion movement here slightly. Zero to one and a half. Right. Zero and plus one. Before I go too mad setting this, let's see what the vertical plane is like. So down here I've got minus 3 and up here I've got plus 5. So I've potentially got some work to do here. Everything is now nice and tight and I'm within just over a thou, 3 o'clock to uh, 9 o'clock. Um, I can tell however I have an issue because the, there are errors at the bottom. Uh, so let's zero out at 6 o'clock, come all the way around to 12 o'clock and I'm getting on for 7 thou amp. So I have an error in this plane and there's clearly no adjustability so let's have a look at the setup and decide what to do about it. So there is an error in the spindle this way on. Now what could contribute to that? Well obviously the bore to spindle relationship is important. The flange face to post relationship is important. I already know that this is uh, in the clear because I've measured it for parallel. But equally the top of this slide versus the spindle relationship also matters. Now the likelihood is all of these bits have a little bit of error that add up to the uh, 7 thou I'm seeing. Now I could go mad trying to find the error. What I'm actually going to do, because this is just a piece designed for this roll and this roll alone, I'm actually going to mark its rotational positioning so that it goes back in the same place. 
I'm going to mark the rotational positioning of the post so it all goes back in the same positions and then I'm going to go to the surface grinder and I'm going to grind um, the correct angle on top of here or should I say the corrected angle to give me the correct spindle angle. The last question to answer is how do I set this up on the surface grinder to remove the right amount of error? Well I've had a stroke of luck. The piece of aluminium in the chuck is a four and a half inch diameter and this piece is I'm going to grind is a four and a half inch diameter. So all I have to do is set it up on the surface grinder with a run of seven thou from here to here grind it and when I put it back together it should have removed the run. I have now got the piece set at the required angle so let me bring you in a bit closer and show you what I've been doing. Here on the world's smallest sign plate I have the components set at the required angle and I'm going to grind this as a flat surface to take the error out in the spindle. Um, with this metric plot I require a run of about 180 microns which you can see I've got over the length and side to side it should be pretty square so 90 microns there and 88 microns there okay so I will now proceed to grind this surface again I have got here the corrected piece which I've just ground and I filed a, a V notch in the um, point that goes at the front so that is going to go on there V notch in line with that I have also filed a V notch into the front of the pillar so basically that's how it's going to sit and on top of this goes the grinding spindle right everything is now fully tight And the results are as follows. Plus half a thou on three o'clock to zero at nine o'clock. Zero at the bottom and plus half a thou at the top. So Mr Crispin considers that acceptable and uh, a job well done, even if I do say so myself. Right, all that remains is to see what effect this has had on the centre height. Right, and on the high spot, let's see what this has done to my centre height. Assuming, of course, the top of this cross slide is trustworthy. I was expecting that to have caused some problems, but it hasn't uh, somehow. All I can think is that the change in angle has balanced out the fact it's dropped down. Well, not bad for a machine setter. I'm pleased with the outcome. It's taken quite a bit of time and a lot of steps, but I now have a perpendicular spindle. The top slide angle is set and the spindle is on centre height. So there's not, not a lot now standing between me and the successful grinding operation. In the next video I will be mounting the wheel, dressing it to the required profile, going through a few bits about different options when grinding and I will 
Grind the Spindle Nose. So until then, I hope you found this interesting. Thank you for watching and see you on the next video.